Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. In today's episode, I am going to be showing you how to make a grouped bar plot in R using ggplot2 and other tools from the tidyverse. I'm drawing my inspiration from a survey that was put out by Oxford University Press. They uh, sent the survey out to over 2,300 uh, researchers across different disciplines in the academy, asking basically, how are they responding to uh, artificial intelligence, AI? And so um, the specifics of the study aren't super important, um, or my beliefs on what I think about AI or, or yours really, what we're really concerned about is making the plot. And so I have a link here that I'll drop below in uh, the description of this video if you want to go ahead and grab it. I did talk about this plot in a newsletter that I sent out uh, back in August. If you're not getting that newsletter, uh, check out the link that I have up here as well as down below in the description so that you can subscribe and so you can get my narrative take on how I would go about building different plots. And my plan then is to revisit those here on YouTube, to remake the plot as the original researchers did, and then to take a whack at improving it uh, with my own sense of style and kind of science. <laughs> and so, um, again, this article from Oxford University Press, I haven't seen published formally, um, but they have a link then that goes to this PDF, uh, which is a slide deck of about 45 slides that goes through different things about their overall findings, their methods, and does a deep dive on all of their results. The figure that I'm interested in is here on their page 20. And so uh, it's, again, a bar plot with numbered annotation for each of the bars across the x-axis. I think there's 10 uh, different categories or questions that they asked researchers their opinion on whether or not they would be in favor of using AI to do these different things. They took the 2,300 researchers and split them into eight groups, varying from pioneers, people who are just all in on AI, to people who are challengers, who are just no, <laughs> no on AI, right? And, and they have kind of a method to do that, and the groups are roughly the same size. Um, and so they then kind of parsed apart how each of those eight groups would respond to, say, um, using AI to help write up their research. All right, so again, this is the plot that I want to make with you all today. So here in our studio, I have some code that will get us going. It's basically a summarization of all of the data that was conveniently included in the plot because they annotated the percents over each of those bars. If you wanna get this code as well as the code that we get at the end of the episode, again, down below in the description, there's a link to a blog post for this episode where I have been including uh, this code. So I forgot to include library tidyverse. We'll get that in before we get proceeding with today's episode. So again, we have OUP data, which is this data frame that has the question, such as using AI to generate ideas for research, the cohort, whether they're a pioneer down to challenger, the number of individuals across all uh, 2,300 who are positive on that, and then the rate for each of the cohorts, right? And so, so for example, uh, careful optimists, 34% of careful optimists were in favor of using AI for generating ideas for research. So our goal is to take this data to generate this plot. So let's go ahead and get started by making a bar plot. We'll do OUP data, and we'll pipe that to ggplot, AES. So again, the aesthetics is the question of what column in OUP data are we mapping to say the x-axis, the y-axis, the colors, whatever, right? And so we'll go ahead and do x equals a question, y equals rate, and then we're gonna do the fill color by the cohort. So on a bar plot, the color inside of the rectangle is the fill, the border is the color. And then we'll go ahead and do geom underscore call. So to make a bar plot, use geom call. Geom bar is something different. Geom bar counts um, the, the number of rows basically in that category before plotting it. So geom bar applies a statistic before generating the, the bar, whereas geom call plots the data as it's given in the data frame. And so here we get a stacked bar plot. I absolutely hate stacked bar plots, just for reference. If instead we had done say geom bar, we'd get an error because I've given it the Y for the rate, right? And so if I removed the rate, then basically we see that we have 
the same number of individuals or same number of rows for each of the cohorts for each of the questions, which uh, that's not what we want. So again, we want to include y equals rate, and then we want to do geom call to get back to our hideous <laughs> stacked bar plot. All right, so the first thing is that it's stacking it. So by default, geom call will stack the different categories or the fills on top of each other, which is handy if you, for some reason, want to make a stacked bar plot, but we want them to the side of each other, and ggplot calls this dodge. And so within geom call, we can then do position equals, and then in quotes, dodge. And so it's hard to see here, but our columns are dodged. Um, you can kind of see um, there's one grouping here, there's another grouping here. There's basically gray lines, which is the background, intermixed between each of the eight different types of cohorts. I'm gonna go ahead and save this to a file to get the right aspect ratio to match what I have in my original file, because using this plotting window is gonna be a real pain because our figure is going to end up being so wide and relatively short. So to do that, I'll do gg save, I'll do ai barplot.png, and then my width. Let's go ahead and make eight, and then I'll do height equals 3.5. And so now we see our figures are basically the same dimensions. It's not exact, but good enough. And so now we can see for sure with the version that we generated that they are grouped going from careful optimists down to weary observers. So one thing I see right off the bat here is that our cohort is in a different order from what we have over here where it started pioneers, careful optimists, cautious time savers, right? Basically what we're seeing for our fill color is that it's alphabetical. We're also seeing the same thing across the x-axis for these different questions, right? So before it was generating ideas for research and it's starting here with analyzing research and going all the way off the right. I can't really see, but trust me, it's, it's alphabetical. I think I see a capital A right in here. So anyway, let's go ahead and clean that up first. Let's get our order of the cohort and the questions to match what we had in the original plot. To do that, we are going to make use of factors. So I'm going to modify these columns where they were found. So basically I'm gonna make the tibble have columns now that are factors. So the question and cohort will both be factors. And so this is gonna get pretty messy here, pretty quick. <laughs> um, and so maybe what we can do is instead of modifying the tibble directly, we will add a mutate statement to this. And so we can do mutate. And so mutate comes to us from the dplyr package which allows you to modify or create whole new columns. So we'll start by modifying the question column, and that'll be a factor, and we'll take the question column again, and then we'll set levels to be these levels. So we'll basically grab uh, this vector, and we can then plop it into here. I'm gonna also modify the cohort, so maybe I'll put question on its own line, uh, and let's clean this up a little bit. Uh, I think in the end, what we'll probably end up doing is having, um, we'll ask our studio to redo the indentation for us. All right. Um, and so just trying to figure out where all my parentheses are. Uh, I think, great, that's there. And then we want to do cohort equals factor on cohort. And then we'll again do levels. Okay. So the idea is that we have a column of uh, string or character data, and we're going to set the order by making that character column into a factor, but then we're gonna set the levels to do something other than alphabetical. And so here then we'll grab uh, this and plop that vector in there. And we can kind of see from the parentheses highlighting what goes with what. I think that looks good. Um, maybe because I've got so much stuff to the right, I'm gonna go ahead and bring the argument for factor uh, over and let's see if we can tab this back. Yeah, it's gonna be kind of funky. All right. So what I'm gonna do then <laughs> is uh, highlight that and let's see if we can go into code and then re-indent lines and that gets things cleaned up for us. All right, besides the formatting, let's go ahead and run this and regenerate the plot. And now what we see is that we do get the correct ordering of things, right? So we have pioneers down to challengers, which was again what we had here, pioneers to challengers. And then we see 
uh, generating ideas for research over here. And I can kind of make out another stage uh, right over here, okay? So I think that looks pretty good for now for getting everything in the right order. Let's now turn to the color. Um, the color might be a little bit more challenging to match, but I have an idea for something that might work, which would be the rainbow palette. And so what we can do is to add to our ggplot pipe here, we can do scale fill manual, and we can then do values equals, and let's do rainbow as a function, and we can put in there eight, because we're gonna have eight colors. And so that rainbow eight gives us eight hex codes um, for our for our different uh, our different cohorts, right? So that's really far from what I had hoped to get. Those colors are, are pretty garish, um, if you ask me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in on this image, and I'm gonna to come to my applications directory on a Mac. Uh, we have a utilities folder, and then there is a digital color meter app that we can use. And so um, if I put my cursor over the purple, we see the purple there, right? So something I'm noticing is it's giving me red, green, blue as uh, numbers in, in decimal format. If I come up to view, I can do display values as hexadecimal. And so now when I put my cursor over that, I see that next to the RGB in that digital color meter window, um, I get hexadecimal. So we get rid of this finder window. And if I do, uh, I can copy it with uh, shift command C and then bring that over here. Um, I think I'll get that hexadecimal, that, that first purple color. And so I'm going to repeat this for the other colors in the palette. All right, so I got all those hexadecimal codes. And when I put those in quotes, I can basically see the color that it's going to represent those as. If I compare their colors to my colors, um, I think they're pretty good. They, they do seem to be a, a pretty good match. So I'm gonna turn this into a vector that we can then use in place of that rainbow function call. Again, every software package has its own color palette and um, we just kind of have to roll. But even though this might not be the color palette we'd choose, it does give us an opportunity to see how we can pick uh, different colors to match what someone else is using, right? So we'll go ahead and replace rainbow with this. I want everything to line up there. We need an extra parenthesis here. Uh, and now if I run this, I now see that my colors do a pretty good job of matching what they had in the original plot. So thinking about this legend, because they put theirs across the top, which has the benefit then of expanding the plot left to right and giving us perhaps more space to see these titles, right? And so what I will do is go ahead and move that and we're gonna put it across the top. The other thing I notice is that their legend doesn't have a title, right? They just have the categories listed. And so what we can do here then would be to add theme and we'll say legend.position and I'm gonna say top, all right. And so we got it at the top and it's going horizontal. I think our font is too big for the space and that they would probably shrink it down a little bit. I also noticed that their symbols are perhaps similar or the same height as their font. So um, let's go ahead and start with removing the title of the legend and then perhaps making that key size as it's called a little bit smaller. So we can take out the title. I'm gonna, we could do that in scale fill manual, right? I could do like name equals null, um, but I think I'm gonna have a labs function before too long. So let's do it there. So we'll do labs and we'll do fill equals null and add that. And so now we see that the title is gone and it is centered. So the next thing I wanna do is let's go ahead and shrink the key size as well as the font. And we can do that in theme where we can do legend dot text and we'll do element text. Again, element text is the function that we can use within theme to modify the appearance of uh, text. And so we'll start with size and let's do eight. Uh, I always like to pick a number and then we can adjust from there. So it's smaller, but it's still quite large. So let's maybe go down to four and that looks pretty good, but maybe we should just go up to one to five and call that good. I think that's nice. So now let's worry about that key size. And so in there, so again, in theme, we can do legend.key and we can do size 
and this is going to take a function called unit and um, we need to give it some number and then unit is going to be uh, PTS is what I will use and so I don't know what that should be <laughs> so let's say let's say five to match the font size I don't know if it's that logical up oh, and it's not happy because I picked PTS uh, maybe it's PT maybe it's PT yes it's PT <laughs> So I like the size of that plotting symbol, the glyph as they call it. Uh, the five point symbol size is the same as the font size. That's great. But um, I do have it still on two rows. I thought that as I made the, the glyph size and the font smaller, that it would then kind of go to a single row, but I see it's still uh, two rows. And so we can do that back here. Um, we can add a guides uh, function. And then I can say fill. So guide is another word for legend. And so we'll say fill guide legend. And so now we're taking that fill, which is the legend, and the guide legend is the function that goes to the fill. It gets a bit complicated. And then we can say n row equals one to hopefully make it a single row. And sure enough, uh, it is now on a single row. Um, I noticed that ours is a bit wider than theirs. And what I'm seeing is that the space between the symbol and our text is um, pretty far apart, right? It's basically the same distance as between like pioneers and the next symbol. I would like the, the distance or the margin between the symbol and the text to be a little bit closer. The question I have, however, is where is the margin? <laughs> is the margin on the text or is the margin on the symbol? So let's start with the text because we already have legend text here. We could do margin uh, and it takes a margin function and there's TRBL, so top, right, bottom, left, the mnemonic is trouble. And so the left margin is the one I want it to be shorter if it's coming from the text. So let's say zero, just to try something extreme. And sure enough, that helped a lot. Um, and I think it could perhaps be one uh, to be a little bit more separated from the plotting symbol. I noticed like concerned pe pessimists and weary observers, it seems like it's right on the cliff. So let's go ahead and make that one. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. Um, it does definitely link, say, like the, the cohort to the symbol, right? And so that looks great. And so there we have our legend across the top in one row um, with the right color matching what they had in the original. So awesome. I think the next thing I want to do, because this bugs me, <laughs> is remove the background and I'm going to use a background like what they have, which appears to be something similar to something like Theme Classic. And so let's go ahead. And before we want to run Theme, we want to run Theme Classic. If I were to put Theme Classic down here at the end, we see that, that it does it, but it's, it's really just kind of funky, right? Uh, so we want to change Theme Classic before the theme. I liken that these theme, like theme underscore functions, do look kind of like the big heavy lifting of modifying the theme. And then we can use theme uh, to subtly modify different parts of the appearance of the plot. And I've got an extra plus at the end here. Good, I like the appearance of this a lot. It's starting to come together, I think. And so I think the next thing I'm going to worry about is my um, axis and namely the spacing that I have around the bars. Uh, and the axis. So you'll see in the Oxford University Press version, the bars sit on the axis and they're a bit closer to the y-axis. Um, I'm also noticing that I think their lines are a little bit thinner than mine, or maybe they're gray, whatever. I'm not gonna worry about that just yet. <laughs> so let's worry about that expansion. And so to do that, we can come in here and I'm gonna put this after scale fill manual and do scale y manual. And I'll do expand equals uh, C0 comma zero. And so that will remove that spacing under the bars. Oh, and ah, I saw scale fill manual, scale, and I thought scale Y manual, scale Y continuous. And so now we see our bars are sitting on the line. That looks good. Uh, let's see if we can reduce some of the spacing between like the axis and the bar. And so we're gonna do something similar, uh, except instead of scale Y continuous, we'll do scale X continuous. And I have to admit, I need to go back and look at what this expansion vector actually is because I don't want it to go to zero, right? So if I go to zero, uh, so it's complaining that I use scale X continuous. I should have used scale X discrete. So let's go ahead and do discrete. So let's go ahead and look at scale X discrete to get a better sense of how this works. 
So we see the expand argument here. And scrolling down, we can see expand. Um, for position scales, a vector of range expansion can't contrast used to add some padding around the data to ensure they are placed some distance from the axes. Uh, so the defaults are to expand the scale by 5% for continuous data and 0.6 units for discrete. So it says we can use the helper expansion function. That function allows you to give it an argument molt and add, um, and you can give it one or two values. Um, if it's the vector is length one, both the upper, lower and upper limits of the scale are expanded outwards. If length two, um, the lower limit is expanded by the first and the second by the second. So I want it to be uniform. So I think what we'll do here then is do expand expansion and we'll do add equals um, and let's do 0 0.6 because I think that should get us what we had before. And so again, this is what the default appearance looks like. Let's go down to say 0 0.5 and that looks pretty good. Um, it's not quite as close as we have on the bottom, but maybe we could try 0 0.4 and that's right up against it. There doesn't seem to be any space uh, on the edges. So let's go back to 0 0.5. That did tie it in a little bit closer uh, than what we had by default. And so I'll roll with that for now. So I seem to have lost my lab. Uh, let's go ahead and remove the title from the legend and fix the Y and X axis titles. And so uh, I'm not sure when I lost that, but let's do labs and we'll do fill equals null. Also on the X axis, you notice their plot doesn't have anything on the X axis. So I'll remove that. And their Y axis also doesn't have anything, right? That it's obvious that it's percent. So let's go ahead and remove all of those titles and we can do fill equals null, x equals null, y equals null, add a plus to the end of that. So one other thing I see on the axis is that theirs goes up to 70 and they've got percents on it. And so let's go ahead and have ours go up to 70. Um, we're gonna want it to go in steps of 10. So we can come back to our scale y continuous and here I'll do lim, Forget that if it's limits or lim, um, limits, uh, and we'll do zero to 70, and we'll do breaks equals uh, seek zero to 70 uh, by 10. Okay, good. So that has us going from zero to 70 like, like they do. Um, that's great. Um, they also have their percent sign next to their number. So let's see if we can't do that as well. And so back up here in scale y continuous, we can add labels. So in the scales package, we'll do labels, label uh, percent, and that should do it for us automatically. I'm not sure if I need those parentheses or not. Well, that added it. <laughs> that got us, I'm not sure what exactly that got us. That added 100, right? Um, but we have this weird spacing uh, that I'm not so fond of. Uh, maybe that's their spacing for a thousand. Um, and so I'm going to look at the help for scales label percent, and maybe that'll give us some information. Uh, so scale 100. So we see scale, a scaling factor, x will be multiplied by scale before formatting. This is useful if the underlying data is very small or very large. So I've already got mine in percent format, so I'll do scale equals 1. And so now I get the nice percent numbers. Their numbers are a bit smaller than mine. So let's go ahead and clean that up a little bit. And here we'll then do axis.text.y. And here we'll then do element text, right? Size equals, let's say 12. That's a lot bigger. Uh, let's do eight. And let's go down to six maybe. Let's try seven. Yeah, probably with six. Let's do that. Cool, I think that looks pretty good. We could also think about making that y axis and x axis a little bit thinner and maybe make it gray. So let's go ahead and do axis.line and we'll do element line. And so by giving it axis.line instead of dot x and dot y, this should modify all of the axis lines. We'll here do, let's do size equals 0 0.5. Uh, that didn't do anything. Uh, I'm getting a warning that size has been deprecated to use line width instead. I have been using size for so long that I don't remember how to do anything else. So, okay. I went down to 0.25 and I think that matches there as a bit better. Um, I also noticed that their axis ticks uh, should probably be the same, um, same thickness. 
And so, yeah, that looks pretty simple. And theirs is gray. So let's go ahead and make the color uh, gray and copy that down. And so now we see um, pretty, pretty decent styling, right? So the next thing I'm going to turn my attention to are these x-axis labels um, that they need to be wrapped kind of like we have here. I noticed that their font is a bit smaller than ours. I think it's the same size font as on the y-axis. And so maybe I can start there with axis.text. Well, I don't need to do anything, right? Let's If they're the same size, I could do axis text and leave out the dot y, kind of like we did for line and ticks. And so that gets it to be... Uh, a smaller font, which is good. And so now to wrap it, so what I would normally do would be to perhaps add a labels to scale X discrete. And what I would then bring in is basically this vector, but I'm repeating this vector multiple times. So I think what I'm gonna do is create a vector up here, I'll call questions and I'll make it this. And then we'll have that be questions. All right, and we will need to bring this over and we'll go ahead and highlight and uh, re-indent the lines, good. And then questions is there and we can do that. So let's go ahead and run this. Oh, I forgot a comma somewhere. Oh, I've got an extra comma here. All right, we'll do that. And then this works. So every, nothing's changed, good. Um, and I think I could also then in here, uh, make my levels my questions, right? Yeah, this will save up some space for us, right? It's always good. Okay, nothing's changed, great. <laughs> and now what I'll do is I will come back up here and I will insert my breaks. So I'll do that by putting a backslash N uh, where I want to have a line break. So if you look at that example, we now see that we have a line break for generating ideas for research, right? And so I'm gonna go ahead and insert the line breaks for all of these, I'll be right back. So it looks pretty good. I think my font is still a little bit too big because my labels are running into each other. So I will come back um, and make my text size maybe five. And I think that looks a lot better and more along the lines of what they had in theirs. Their font may have been bold. Let's see what happens if we make the text bold. So we'll do face equals bold. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. So the next thing I wanna take on with the X axis is inserting these numbers. So I could have hard coded or written in the numbers into these question labels, but I kind of felt like that would be cheating because realistically this OUP data is probably the summarization of a of survey, right? That has those 2,300 responses. And so I could imagine calculating those positives like we have here. And perhaps um, they may have added data or had to remove data for some reason, right? And so then to, to update the label, you'd have to go in and manually change the count versus doing it programmatically, um, you could have updated the, the positives column. And so my preference is to not hard code numbers into uh, strings. And so I would prefer to do it uh, using something like glue or the paste function from based R. So I'm going to start by doing library glue. What I'll do is I'll take OUP data and bring it down and we're going to make a pretty data frame, if you will. And so again, OUP data has our question, our cohort, our, oh, I misspelled positives and our rate. So let me go ahead and fix positives real quick here. Uh, missed an I. So if we take OUP data and do a select on question and positives, we get these two columns. But of course, many of these are redundant because we had those eight different cohorts within them. And so I can simplify this further by doing distinct. And so that will then give me the 10 distinct rows, right? So for each question, we have a specific number, right? And so I want this positive merged with this question. And so what I could do then would be to do mutate and I'll make a pretty column. And again, we'll use glue and we'll take the question and we're gonna add together the positives, right? So we'll do question uh, in quotes and then also in curly braces that will insert the value from question there. And then we'll do N equals and then again in curly braces positives. 
right? And then a close parenthesis. So then that gets us a pretty <laughs> gnarly looking data frame here, right? But that's our pretty column, right? And so what we could do then would be then to pull pretty. And so then that gets us a vector of our pretty values. And we can see that it's inserted those there, right? Cool. And so I'm gonna call this pretty label and we'll then insert that in scale X discrete. And so here then I will then do labels equals pretty label. And like that, we get the N inserted with our label. So one thing I'm noticing about theirs is that for the last two categories, the N was included on a new line. So I'm gonna go ahead and insert a line break for these last two groups. And I'll do that back up here where I defined the questions. Um, and that will be here for outreach content and another stage. And so then that gets us uh, the nice labeling, right? Cool. All right, so one other thing I notice about this x-axis is that we have tick marks in the middle of the category. They have their tick marks between the categories. So let's start by removing the tick marks. And so I will then add axis.ticks.x. I'm gonna do element blank. And I see that I had axis ticks here to make them gray, and that's on the Y axis. So I'll go ahead and put that Y in there. And so now we've removed our X axis tick marks. So now the next question is how to get this tick to be between the groupings of categories, right? So if this was continuous data, I might use the, the minor grid lines or the minor tick marks to, to put that in, but it doesn't work like that for discrete data. So I'm gonna trick ggplot into doing this for me by adding an annotation of a segment that actually extends below the x-axis. So we'll do this in a couple of steps. Again, this is a very minor detail, but I think it helps illustrate a few concepts that I have been practicing with in my own code lately. And so the first thing we need to do is go ahead and do chord Cartesian, and we'll do clip equals off. And so what clip equals off does is that it removes the clipping of the data. Basically, I'm just repeating what it says, but no, it's it's allowing us to see the data that falls outside of the plotting window. So the other thing I need to do in here is to define the y-axis limits. And so here I'll do y lim equals c zero to 70, and I will remove it from here. And that's because scale y continuous will remove anything that doesn't fall between zero and 70, whereas chord Cartesian just doesn't show it if it's not there, right? And so it's a subtle, but again, important difference. So let's go ahead and run this and we should see nothing's changed. Sure enough, it looks the same, cool. And now what we wanna do is add the annotation of a segment line. And so I'll come back up here to geom call and do annotate. And the geom we want is a segment. And we now need to give it X values and Y values. And so if we're giving it a segment, we need X and X end, Y and Y end. So X, I actually am not totally sure what those units are between the different blocks of um, pillars, right? And so we see that it happens before and after, before and after, before and after. And so I kind of think that the center is one and that it's a half and a half. Let's try seek 0.5 to 10.5 by 0.5, and that will be our x, and then we'll do the same thing for x end, because it's a vertical line, the x position is the same, and then y I'll put at zero, and y end I'll put at, let's say minus, or let's, let's say five, okay? And I'm gonna make this color red so that it's obvious what it is, and uh, I think I'm missing a parenthesis here somewhere. Nope, okay, cool. So now we have our segments every half unit, right? And so it's going every half unit because I did seek 0.5 to 10.5 by 0.5. So let's do that by one instead, because then we'll get 0.5, one and a half, so forth. Cool, all right, now let's flip it down. And so we'll make our Y end, let's make that minus two, and so now we have the tick mark going down, but two is probably too long. Why don't we go ahead and make that minus 0 0.5, and we could probably go ahead and make that, let's make it one, minus one, that looks good. And so now we wanna make the color gray. 
Um, we also want to make the thickness the same thickness that we had for these other line widths, right? So that was line width of 0 0.5, color gray. And so we'll come back up here to this annotate. I'll remove this color red. Sometimes I like to use a garish color like that so it's easier for me to see where it is. And there we go. We have our tick marks between the different groups of categories. And I think that looks pretty nice. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know that we actually need these tick marks between the different groups of categories, but whatever software it was probably added that there by a default. Okay. So the next thing we need to do is I've been putting off putting these labels on the bars, the percentages, right? So how would we do that? Well, that's a piece of data. And so that's a label, right? And so what we'll do is we'll add here label equals, and it's going to be the percent number, right? And so that's the rate column. And then we'll do geome text. And so now what we see is that our numbers are all on top of each other. Do you remember what we did for the bar plot when it did that? Yeah, we used position dodge. So we, we'll see that back up here. In fact, I'm going to copy <laughs> and paste the same thing. And I get an error that width not defined set position width. And so uh, we can write this out a bit different with position dodge. Uh, position dodge as a function is the same as writing dodge. And let's do width equals 0 0.1. All right, so that dodged it, but not very much. Um, let's come back and let's do one. All right, so that looks pretty good. Although I noticed that at the extremes within a block, it's too far out. So instead of, perhaps instead of width equals one, let's do 0 0.8. All right, that's too far in. Let's try 0 0.9. And that looks pretty right. Um, we notice that the numbers are right on the Y axis point. And so we actually want it to be above that. And so I think it's using a V just, so vertical justification. And so what we could do here then would be to do V just equals zero. I forget if zero is the top or the bottom, but we'll find out. And so that is at the top. That font is way too big. Let's go ahead and shrink the font size down. And so let's put this on a new line. And then let's do the same. That's actually smaller than what we have for our Y axis labels, which I believe was five, right? Yeah, five. So let's go down to three. Uh, so we'll do size equals three. And so I'm forgetting that the geome size is different <laughs> than the axis size. So we need to go down even further than three. Uh, let's try one. Okay, now that's too small. So let's try two. And that's still too big. I'm going to try one and a half to split the difference here. And we'll do 1.5. Great. So I'm noticing that mine is right on the top edge of the bar, whereas theirs has a bit of a space to it. If I do geom text, uh, look at the help for that, this might be able to help us. So there's a nudge X and a nudge Y. And I think we probably want to nudge things up in the Y axis position, right? And maybe we'd rather use that than V just. So let's look at nudge and see what it has to say to us. All right, horizontal and vertical adjustment. So it says it can't be used jointly with position. Um, that surprises me. Let's try um, and see. I don't, I don't believe it, so I want to test it. So let's go ahead here and do, let's do nudge Y and let's do two. Yeah, it's complaining. Interesting. All right, so we'll undo that. And I think I see something else we could try. So I was looking at label padding, but that's something else. That's for geom label, I believe, not geom text, right? So that's label padding and geom text doesn't have that. So I think what I will do instead will be to use my own AES for this function. So we'll do AES y equals rate, right? So this should get us the same plot, which we do. And I think what I want to do is increase the y value by uh, say two percentage points. So we'll say plus two. And so now that's higher. Let's maybe bring it down to plus one. And I think that looks pretty good. One thing you're probably noticing is that we don't have our percents on here. And so what I'm going to try to do is use that scales uh, label percent function that we saw earlier 
when we were messing with the y-axis. So here we can again do label equals rate and I'll do scales label percent and let's put this on a separate line so we can see it um, and we'll put rate in here and we'll say scale equals one and it's complaining so if I look at the help for this um, I see that it, it actually I think is outputting a function rather than a vector uh, let's look down here at the value uh, it re returns a labeling function all right so that's not exactly what I want to use um, that's mostly useful for the scales functions um, as it's saying here all right so instead what I will do is I will come back up to my code where I generated the tibble and I will do another mutate and I will then do rate equals glue and then we'll do uh, in quotes curly brace rate close curly brace percent and now um, it's unhappy why are you unhappy oh and I think I put it in the wrong place so yeah I need to put it between those parentheses not within them all right so this should work now so I need to remove where I had uh, the scale here right so this should just be straight up rate all right we'll get there so now it's complaining um, and I think the problem is that I'm using rate both for the y-axis as well as for the x-axis and so I think I need a pretty rate so I'll make this instead of rate pretty rate all right and then here for our label we could put pretty rate so cool that looks pretty much the same as theirs um, theirs is a stronger font maybe I'll go ahead and make it bold just just to do uh, and back here we can do blue face equals bold uh, and I think it's font face so, so for some of these functions it's font face and for some it's face so we'll do font face and now it's that bold color cool um, finally I know this video is going long I want to go ahead and add the title as well as this caption at the bottom and so I'm going to go ahead and come back in to the labs function here and we had title and we also have a caption and so I'm going to go ahead and type that in here real quick so you don't have to watch me fumbling over my keyboard very good so we see that we have a little bit of formatting to do um, that there's wraps um, on the title and also theirs is justified with the numbers not with the um, axis so let's go ahead and start by justifying it with the numbers and making it bold and we'll also see how we can get it to wrap and so let's come and we'll do plot dot title dot position and so this tells us that the alignment of the plot title subtitle and caption right and so it this this argument applies both to the title and subtitle the value of panel um, is aligned to the plot panels of plot is to the titles so we'll do position and we'll do plot and so now it's justified to the left we'll go ahead then and do plot dot title equals element text face see what I mean face here <laughs> who knows bold and so now it's bolded and let's go ahead then and let's see how we can get it to wrap uh, around the plot we can do that using element text box simple and element text box simple comes to us from the gg text library which I already have in here so let's go ahead and look at this and so now I see that I've got the title wrapping uh, kind of like theirs although theirs wraps after followed but it's more truncated I think their font is smaller um, I'm gonna leave this in here just because um, I wanted to show you how to use element text box simple and of course we could make the font smaller but then it's gonna wrap at a different position so I'm cool with the way this looks one thing they do have is a margin at the bottom here I'll add to this margin let's put this on a separate line equals margin and then on the bottom um, I'll put um, let's put 15 and the default is points and so that gets us a bit of space there that looks I think pretty good 
Um, I think this legend maybe needs to come down a little bit, but I'm not going to worry about that uh, just yet um, or at all, really. <laughs> um, this, this video I know is getting long, so let's leave that there. Uh, and then let's think about this caption in the bottom left. Ours is um, on the right. So let's come back and we will do um, plot caption position again equals plot. So that'll, when we left justify it, we'll get it to be on the left side of the window. And then we'll do plot.caption and we'll do element text and we'll do size equals, let's do eight. And I forgot to left justify it. So we also then need to do h just equals zero. Now it's left justified. The font is too big still. So let's go ahead and drop that down to like five. And that is a pretty good size font. Um, and again, there's differences between the two plots. I'm not gonna belabor the point. I think we've done a pretty good job of matching the appearance of the two plots. There's subtle differences here that we might play around with. Of course, the font size, their font, it's kind of pixelated in my version. So um, I'm not sure if it's exactly black or maybe like a really dark blue. I'm not gonna worry about it. Um, they also have a left margin on their panel and their caption is tied over to the left. I feel like they may have added this after the fact using PowerPoint or something like that. Anyway, again, my goal here was to reproduce what they had done. And I think this is a pretty good reproduction using ggplot2 of what we see in this figure. Let me know what you think down below in the comments. I'm sorry this video has gotten rather long. If you have suggestions for other figures that I should take a look at and that you would love to see me make here on Code Club, by all means, please let me know. In the next episode, I will be taking this figure and I will be redoing it the way I would have done it if I had the data and I was the person asked to generate the visualization. So that you don't miss that exciting episode, please make sure that you've subscribed to the channel and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.